Good afternoon and welcome to Bitten by the Bug uh, Stitching with Andrea Taylor and today we're going to be looking at uh, casings and different types of applications of um, a type of patchwork cord stitch and flip application. So in what we have here is a, a glasses case. And it's a very popular glasses case um, to make and usually I do it in the borrow style. Okay, I'll talk about that in a moment, but in this case, in this one, I've done in the stitch and flip style. So this here is a pincushion or the start of a pincushion, the top of a pincushion, and it uh, was also done in the uh, stitch and flip style uh, with a little bit of hand dyed indigo of mine as well. And you can see by the back that the stitching is all inside uh, these stitched and flipped areas. This one was done on the sewing machine and it's all done on a foundation of calico, which makes it nice and strong and sturdy and, and pretty stable as well. So later on, I'll put it back on that and I will stuff that and that will be a pincushion. Okay, this one here is the glasses case we'll be looking at today. But what we're looking at mainly is, is this casing here. This casing here has what we call a squeeze frame in it. And squeeze frames are used quite a lot in Japan uh, for small bags and items like this where you need a good closure. And you don't want to put a, a zip in, it's too small for a zip area or a button, but you want a good secure um, closure. Okay, let's look at the pattern itself. Uh, the pattern itself, if you, um, I, it comes from Bitten by the Bug, my business, and it is a kit to be done in the borrow style. So we'll have a quick talk about borrow. Uh, before we move on. Borrow is the raw edge patchwork or patching of raw edge pieces in the style of um, a borrow stitching, the Japanese borrow stitching. Everybody's work in this regard is individual and um, original and it is determined by your stitching as well as your patches. In Japan it is done as a utilitarian and a purposeful way of um, restoring textiles to make them last longer, to be able to be used in futon covers and clothes. Okay, but we in the West uh, have become quite uh, enamored, I suppose is a good word for it, in this technique, and we are trying to uh, emulate it and make it our own. So I will say about uh, borrow style stitching is, is uh, you should respect its origins and make it your own. Do it in your style so you're not copying anyone. You have a unique piece of textile by the finish of it. Okay, it's almost like a fingerprint. I always know my work as opposed to other people's and my work changes a little as well and um, becomes uh, a unique piece of textile. Okay, so... Today, though, we're going to be looking at the stitch and flip technique. And it is just another way of making up this um, borrow, um, this glasses um, pouch. And once you've made one, you've got the instructions to make as many as you would like. And you can change it into this type of uh, style stitching. Again, uh, just move this out of the way. This is what we're going to be working on. Again, this is done on a foundation. Foundation can be any piece of stable cotton. I would say cotton is the best thing. In this case, I've used calico. But it can be anything you've got um, around, old sheeting, anything like that, which is stable, pre-washed, is very good too. You start off with a piece in the centre, a five-sided um, piece. It can be three, five, or it could be seven uh, pieces, uh, sides. But what you need to be aware of is that should be an uneven number it is more pleasing to the eye. Okay, in these two pieces, I've used pieces of sashiko. With my sashiko, which I um, 
do large pieces of sashiko i actually cut mine up quite frequently i i do use use some big pieces in my work but a lot of the time i cut it up and use it in small areas and small pieces and this in this case this is where these two are and this is what where it came from this is probably about the last piece i have left to be able to use okay let's have a look what stitch and flip is and how to go about it okay using lots of scrap fabrics that's the beauty of using uh, stitch and flip uh, it can use up a lot of pieces that you maybe you don't want to throw away or you feel bad about throwing away in these days uh, but and you want to use them up okay five-sided figure in the, in the middle depending on the size of your initial fin what your finished piece will be that can be bigger could be smaller as well I uh, just played that by ear but w the main thing is to have a nice pile of um, scraps that you can use so that you that you can cut around so your scraps shouldn't be too small so this is number one or your base piece and it can be located anywhere on that um, foundation I'm going to lay a piece of fabric on that base piece and it should extend further both ends of the base piece hang off the end okay and that's a bit of insurance but it, but it really does make life easier if you do now today i'm just using a piece of uh, sashiko threaded in a uh, sashiko needle just to show you how this is done in a quick way uh, you could do this by hand i've done it by hand as well as by machine and works equally as well and I'm just looking out to see where the end of the base piece is so I'll stop there I don't need to go any further than that and you can see my stitches are quite large and that's okay uh, because you need you need to at home see what I'm actually doing so if I was doing this um, for myself I would make those stitches a bit smaller and make my thread a matching thread okay now you can uh, end that off with a, with a stitch okay or leave it hanging it doesn't really matter and we're going to then flip that okay so this is where the stitch and flip comes in we now rotate it and we work on the next piece we're going anti-clockwise too now if you have a fabric that's hard to fold it doesn't want to fold over really cleanly uh, get yourself a hera marker or you can even iron it a hair marker is really good because you don't have to jump up to the iron and that gives you a crease on your fabric it's got a a soft um i, I suppose you could call it a soft sharp edge a beveled edge anyway that gives you a really nice um a flattening uh, um ability japanese use them a lot for lots of textile work they're used in paper craft work and book binding as well Okay, so now I'm going to go grab my second piece, okay, this one here, and I'm going to lay that out extending past uh, base piece or first piece and going just past your second piece like that. Okay, put a pin in there so that holds together. And then stitch that together now you can see i've got a really big piece hanging off the end here and that's okay because that will just get cut off and used in a different area i like to mix up the fabrics i use so they um, have a little bit of um, interest in diversity but i love textures uh just as equally as much as i like um prints different textures and different weaves are just as interesting i feel okay all right now i'm looking out to see where uh the first piece is or the base piece and i want to stitch just to that point there and there we go take out the pin and put a holding stitch there so it doesn't come undone and cut that off i now will trim this large piece back to piece two like so 
I said, don't get rid of it, you might need it. And then flip that over. And with my hero marker, give that a bit of a crease on that seam allowance. You can see it creases nice and cleanly. Now you might notice I've got this little area here, this little gap area, and that's okay. It's not a problem. Uh, in when I have finished going all the way around this base piece, I will then put a piece on there and stitch and flip it there. And you have a nice interesting corner. You can even bring it back quite a fair, fair way and just audition it to make sure that it will um, get to the corner there like that. But that gives you a bit of interest on your corner. So there's never a wrong um, positioning or wrong way of how this works. It's just, it's very adaptable and you can make things work because what you are actually doing is covering a piece of fabric um, with another piece, with lots of little pieces of fabric. Okay, so I'm looking for some something else in my pile of pieces. I have lots of piles of little pieces, as I'm sure lots of other people do. I don't like throwing out fabric. Um, even if it is a really small piece, I don't like throwing it out because it could be used in doing this type of work, stitch and flip. Okay, another piece, another piece of blue. It's nice and good and clear for you to see. Now, this little area here is really very important. This is the lowest point of your two junctions of fabric. And so your next fabric must sit at the lowest point. If it sits at the highest point, when you sew it and stitch and flip, you'll have a big gap of um, of your foundation or your calico which is not what you want to see okay so always go to the lowest point and always extend that's important too put a pin in here and then in this case i'll put a pin past here but as you can see i've gone past my foundation i'll move my hand past my foundation and i'll give that a trim in a minute because it almost gives you a false sense of um like the the size of the piece you net you are working on and you actually aren't working on that bigger piece at all okay so here and i'm going to sew across here now i would obviously be doing small stitches when i would be doing this as a real um uh for my you know a real piece that i'm going to use uh, but for your being able to see um doing nice big stitches so you can and in contrast so you can see what i'm up to what i'm doing so so across this area here i'm doing the folding method sometimes easier when your fabric is quite thin to fold the fabric onto the needle okay Right, that's your next bit. I then trim this previous bit back here. Like so. And then I'll flip this and give this a little crease. Like so. And then turn it over to, to the wrong side and give this a trim too. Give all this area a trim as well. I'll just retrieve my needle and thread before I cut through that as well. I don't want to do that. And I'll put that over there. All right, so I'm now going to trim through this area here. I said, and it gives you a more indication of what you're actually doing uh, when you trim it back and how much you've actually covered. Okay, it gives you a more um, better clue as to what you're doing. Okay, so this technique was used a lot in Victorian times, um, back in the 20th century, and was used um, to form the work called Crazy Patchwork. And Crazy Patchwork w were made into very, very... Um, big quilts, bed quilts mainly, and these these where these uh, seams are were all decorated with embroidery, uh, with surface embroidery. In the middle, quite often the middle was embroidered 
by itself and it stood out as a feature. So it was a very, very, very decorative um, form of um, patchwork. Uh, it used up a lot of scrap and quite often velvet was, high, was used a lot in this technique. Um, it was a very showy way of using um, uh, up some scraps. Okay, right. N next piece, I'm going to go from there to there. And you can audition it, turn it back on itself and see if that's what you want it to look like. And you might go, oh, no, I'm not really quite happy with that, that style of fabric with these ones, which are very rustic looking. So you might go, no, no. But if you've got enough fabric to work with, um, then you can use all sorts of things. I actually even sometimes put sashiko uh, scrap in in the section area here too. You can you can do that too. I've got another piece here, um, another big piece of sashiko here, um, and you could actually lay that on there and stitch and flip and have a piece of sashiko in a different area rather than the middle. Okay, so that's that's um, quite acceptable as well. Or I can just, um, let's see, I've got a, um, some dragonfly fabric here. I might just put that one in there. Okay, so that would go out to that point there. And I'll pin that in place and I'll stitch that next. And then you can see that I lose quite a lot of different fabrics. Uh, by the next piece that is joined in. So if you think that one is sort of like taking over and uh, becoming too dominant, um, just remember quite often a lot of it is disappears on your next with your next piece that's added in. So stitch this one on. So again, I'm doing the folding the fabric onto the needle instead of um, trying to stitch. Yeah. I think I'll take use this needle because it's a little bit bigger eye. This is a sashiko. I use sashiko needles most of the time for my stitching. Uh, whether it's sashiko stitching or this type of work, they're very strong and they're very sharp and they don't tend to flex or bend and and very strong as well. So I tend to use them for most things. I'm actually stitching with sashiko cotton at the moment because, as I said, you can see it really, really well. Okay, I'm going to cut this piece now off like that and I'm going to then flip this one you can see this is an enormous piece of fabric but it's all right it's not going to stay that way unless I chose to it for it to which I don't um, so it'll end up being you know probably half that size or even a third of that size uh, by the time I finish this. So the next one, which is then finally finishing this almost uh, a circle, I suppose, of stitching, uh, will um, come through uh, number, this is number one, number two, number three, number four, number five, number six will actually sew through this one and through this one here. Now, if you didn't want too much of this blue, I could just cut that off now. I could cut this back. Uh, uh, and I will have a lot less of that shown. So I'll show you what happens when that when you do that. It's all about changing the shape. It's really actually what you're doing. You're changing these shapes to suit what you want it to look like. So you can see here, I have um, when you have a smaller area, you can come down to quite small little pieces that are exposed and the balance is quite uh, quite okay. When you're in a, a bigger area, your pieces tend to be a, a little larger. This one is very even. 
in its format. If you go around and around, it's almost like a lens of a camera. It goes in around and around. But um, I also make, uh, do it with, um, as you can see, this one here is done in the same way. And the middle of it is this one here, which is a Kogan type um, sashiko. And you can work out which one is the first one. So that was number one. Number two, number three, number four, number five, number six, and then this one, number seven. And then because I wanted to get this up to the size I wanted, I then added in that one. Okay, there. And and then this one, and then this one, and then this one. And that becomes that panel. Okay, there. And then I... I you can't say replicated because they never really look the same as each other. This one then was done, and this large piece of the sashiko then finished off that size because I didn't want to cut through all of that. I wanted to show that. Okay, so this is um, the casing as well, and this is the long version or the wide version of a bag with the same type of casing that we're going to look at at the glasses case. But we will go into squeeze frames. So squeeze frames don't usually come this long. So in this case, it ended up a drawstring. Okay, so drawstring works really well, well in this type of casing as well. Okay, put that aside and go on with this one. Now, I'm now going to bring this in and it's going to be uh, maybe not as long as it would appear. I maybe don't want all that dragonfly in that one spot. I might want to bring in the dragonfly over here as well. So uh, by having it that wide, I, I, I'm sort of very limited to get more bits in. So instead of stitching right across, I'll stitch only from halfway across the dragonfly and through. But I am still extending down past that area there. So just thread a needle and put a knot in it and put a pin a pin in this so it doesn't move around. Obviously when the pieces start to get bigger, you might want to put a few more pins in. Now what I am doing is making sure I'm the lowest point. The lowest point is the center area at this point here. And this is coming across it and wants to sit naturally flat on this angle. And that's fine. I'll let it. And then I'm just going to stitch from the middle this time. And stitch across this area here. So once I've put on this last one where I've covered the whole center of this. I will then do the areas or the side areas which have no um, still need covering of the foundation. So you then work wherever you would like to work to bring in the variety uh, of uh, fabrics. So you can work one corner and then work the other corner, for example. Okay, all right. Go to the back, take out the pins and flip it like so. And you can see here, I need to get rid of that piece because it will not only cause too much thickness, it will have a shadow through and that's not very nice. So don't forget to do that. All right, and this one here, I will take that off in a minute, but I just want to have a look at it. Yep, that's okay. One, two, three, four, tiny one there, five, straight through. Okay, because I didn't want it to go straight through on such a, um, uh, a sort of like obvious angle, I'm going to cut that bit off and lay that down, get my hair a marker, crease that in there and take that pin out, it's not needed anymore, put that one up there and now my next bit will go through here so if I trim this bag um, this dragonfly fabric you'll see what I mean by 
decreasing the fabric that you see. Okay, it's still quite a large piece of fabric. And um, if you like it that way, then that's, that's all very well. Just leave it. But personally, I feel that it needs to be a little um, reined in, I suppose you could say. And I will get another bit of scrap. Make sure it extends so it's about the right. And at this point, I will uh, pin it on as if it's stitched. Sometimes I do do this and I sort of uh, audition it to see what it looks like and see if I'm happy with it. So I'm because I've got this big bit out of it. Yep, okay, that will be fine. So that one will be my next bit that's on. I will then trim this off after it's after this is stitched on like that and then i'll put another piece here and then a corner okay so then that that corner is done and then i'll put another piece on there and then a piece going through up there and then the whole piece is then covered so that is a i suppose a crash course in doing uh stitch and flip foundation work all the seams are inside you can see here the seams are at the back um here uh, and that then can be embellished so when i say embellish you can see this bag before um, i have quilted or embellished around the central core area and then up through one so this is a, a insurance again because this will be done at this point now so i could stitch around this area here um, to give it decoration or just because it will make it even more secure but in this case, I could even continue on this way with this thicker thread and then do this. And it, you would never, never know that I've been doing it with a thick thread with big, huge stitches. You would never know. Okay, so this one here has got blue around it. And you can hardly see it because it's um, sashiko thread. Very, very hard to see. Um, but this one is then the star. Okay, so moving on back to the glasses case. So once I have done this, uh, I will then trim that back to five to by seven, five by seven inches, and then choose a back. I'll move this out of the way and bring this one in. So the back I've chosen for this one, um, which is lovely stars with this flash of white, is this one here. Now you've got to be careful with uh, things that you use all the time, like glasses cases, uh, that don't choose a really light colored fabric because it'll get very dirty pretty quickly uh, and so darker fabric is to your advantage this fabric here is a pure linen and it's i sashiko on i'll try any fabric once and i love sashikoing on linen it's a beautiful fabric to stitch on and gives you some great results this is uh, lots of different types of linens to choose from Okay, so if I turn this suit to the wrong side, you'll see uh, what I actually did. So I trimmed and I cut a back piece five by seven and I trimmed my foundation, or in this case, my sashiko piece, to five by seven inches. So it looked like this. And then I ironed on some iron-on felt, which looks like this. And it's a very stable um type of um, padding padding which gives you a lot of body and it's used by embroidery machine embroidery, embroidery people to stabilize fabric uh, when there's heavy embroidery so it's great great to use if you can find it and it's almost like commercial felt with a sticky layer but if you can't find it use pellon or use a good quality interfacing iron-on interfacing with your pellon to give you even more body I include this in all my kits where I require you to have body to your finished product because I always think that the foundation or the inside of something is just as important as the outside and it must be strong and look good. Okay, so once I have ironed on um, the iron-on felt, I then seam it, seam around three sides, cut the corners off, uh, so you can turn it through to the right side like this and then if you need to point it or get those corners nice and clean and pointed out a really good little tool to have on hand is a 
chopstick. So grab hold of a chopstick and point it out, point out your corners and you should not be able to get through that hole and it should be nice and stable and kind of like that. So what we are looking at mostly today is, is doing the casings for uh, a um, glasses case like this or as I said it applies to a bag as well, a bigger bag as well, not just a glasses case. So in your kit you will have two pieces of fabric that are six inches by two and a half inches so six inches by two and a half inches and you'll hem the two short ends so it's turning it over twice and stitching it okay like so and then fold it in half wrong sides together and you'll make like a tube now you can sew across that if you wish to at this point i don't i personally don't think it's necessary but if you feel like you want to then do it I then lay these up to, to in line, all the raw edges in line with the top of the glasses case and with the side seam where the side area is here and put a, a pin in there and put a pin in on this side. It'll be a tight fit. It should be a tight fit. And we should have as little gap between this side and this side as we can manage. So lay this one up. You can see here they're in line here. This is, this is the casings area. And line that up. And then you're going to sew this to the top edge. Okay, so I'm going to use a thicker thread or sashiko thread just so you can see it. Um, obviously if you wanted to you could tack this on as well uh, and then do your final by little stitches by hand or on the sewing machine so i'm using this fine sashiko thread pull one of these out and cut it in half because it would be a bit long for what i want to do so i cut that in half and thread my needle and stitch around the top edge of that okay in the meantime i'm doing this you will be picking your lining and lining i feel in a bag in any bag really um, should not be too dark if your lining is very dark it's very hard to see into your bag to find things so i try and keep it light without going so light that it would get dirty in five minutes because that's not good either so it's a fine line i suppose you could say between the choice of of lining uh, um in this regard okay right so what i'm doing now is stitching these so these are nice and close together but not obviously not crossing over because this is a casing and big stitches are fine in, in this point in time because I want it this done fairly quickly so I can move on to the next step but it's nice to be able to take the pins out so you can really see my nice big stitches as I said you would not be doing ones this big if you were doing this unless you knew it was going to be tacking and you were going to take it out okay so you will have picked your lining you will cut that also to five by seven and have that ready to go. Pin out and line that up. All good. Okay. Now you can see I'm about a quarter inch in. Um, I'm a person who does a little bit bigger seams and quarter inch. Uh, if you're doing this this part on the sewing machine, um, that's okay too. But do it as close, like quarter inch to the edge or even closer if you can manage it. Because this seam, this seam holding this casing on will stay there um, if you were doing this in real time 
and it gives you a bit of insurance because it means that the when the lining's sewn on, the casing is also sewn on as well. So there will be two lines of stitching there. So it is uh, it is a good way to do it. I feel. Okay, so that is now on. Now your casing was on to the right side. We're on the right side of our glasses case as well. Got to mention that. And that's important as well. And you can, you've got the fold of the casing and the raw edges at the top and the little areas here where your um, squeeze frame will be um, put in, threaded through. Okay, your lining. Grab hold of your glasses case and feed it into the lining. The lining should always be on the outside. If you put the, if you turned the actual bag through to the wrong side and put the lining inside, it will always be too loose when you come to do the next step. So it is important that you remember that lining should always go on the outside of a bag. In this in this regard, it just gives you a much tighter, firmer fit. Okay, all right, so next step, oh, forgot to mention, when you, you will have sewn your lining together and you will leave an opening at the bottom. So along the long sides, just around the bottom edge and leave an opening here. Okay, you're gonna line up all these edges here and it's a lovely tight fit and you will sew around there a little bit bigger than a, a quarter inch seam. Okay, so that's all ready to be assembled. So we'll have a look at this one, which has already been assembled and I'll turn it through to the wrong side so you can have a look um, where the lining, how the lining works and how I went about uh, stitching it onto the top here. Okay, if I turn this, if I push this through the hole in the bottom, you will be able to see my stitching lines for the casing and the lining together because there's two, two lines. It's important, you can see it's much easier to have a hole in the bottom of the bag to be able to pull it through too. Now, if you look at here, this is the light, this is the stitching line of use my hair about her, stitching line here to put the lining on. And if you look inside here, there are two lines of stitching. One was to put the casing on to the bag, and then the other one is for the lining. So the lining should should always sit below the casing line. So when you turn it through, you won't have another line of stitching showing, which I call tram lines, which then you would feel you needed to remove because it doesn't look very attractive. It doesn't look very nice. Okay. So you've sewn around this top edge like so. You pull it through the hole. So the lining then will look like so. You will join up this this opening here slip stitch it close blind hem it close and then push the lining into the bag again using your chopstick you can use the big end with that in just to position your lining into your bag okay let's have a look at squeeze frames squeeze frames come in different lengths uh, and they actually come in different widths as well so this one's a four inch long one and about, oh, I'm not really sure of the depth of it, the width of it. Oh, here we are. It might tell me on here. Hmm. No, of course not. I think it's about um, some of the 1.5, 1.5 um, centimetres, not millimetres, centimetres this way. Uh, some of them are two, some of them are one. Okay, It doesn't really seem to make a lot of difference, this direction, but it will make a lot of difference of how wide your casing is. So I told you to cut two and a half inches, which will then go down to about one inch finished. And obviously you've got to be able to fit this through the casing. 
So if this is too tight, you'll run into a lot of trouble trying to get your squeeze frame through the casing. Okay, the, these, these squeeze frames have a one side it opens the other side with a permanent bolt in it and these are beautiful brass ended ones which i get from japan they're just the most beautiful ones so if you can find those um yep really great ones to use some of them are um they're steel but the brass at the end is not as polished as these and they work too they're good and they can be quite long ones so they're good in cross body bags uh, but always remember that your squeeze frame should be just a little bit shorter than your casing that's going through as well because it gathers up slightly so you can't see anything but uh, the ends of the squeeze frame. So what we're doing now is we're going to feed the two ends of your squeeze frame into the casing, just fiddling around, feeding it through. And as I said, depending on if, if you've been really good with this allowing it enough for your casing, it'll feed through quite well. Okay, then, then we slam it shut like a gate at the end and we'll have a little bolt, a little, um, uh, little sort of flat nail bolt when it has a little uh, burnished area in the middle of it, of this bolt -y thing. And you use a little hammer to just tap that through and it'll get it'll be then permanently in that little um, uh, brass end and it will look like that because I'm not going to do that now um, I will do it <laughs> when I'm ready to put that as in permanent these ones are permanent okay it's very hard to get these out again so when you put it in you've got to be sure it is finished and it's ready to go in there is another type then has a loop on the end, a round loop, and then a curl at the bottom. They are quite easy to get out. And they are quite often used to hang a, um, a lobster claw hook or a tie um, uh, a cord on or uh, put a shoulder strap uh, attached to. They're pretty strong, so they're not going to come undone. But one end is always going to be undone so you can feed it through and then you curl the end of those up, okay, to, for it to hold on. Okay, these are the ones I prefer to use as a glasses case. They're neat and they're tidy and they do the job. Okay, so if I was to have that in, you can see what happens now. You hold on to that and it opens out like as it is supposed to, as a squeeze frame to put your glasses into. And then closes closes on, closes together, and your glasses will not fall out. So it's a pretty secure uh, little opening. Okay, so as I said before, this casing is not exclusively used for using um, squeeze frames. Your casing can be used for drawstring bags, like so. I still do about a two and a half inch even though the cord is finer, uh, it gives you a lot cleaner uh, draw up of your uh, wax cotton cording. I use wax cotton cording, cording and I always uh, decorate the ends because I don't like seeing knots on that. And my lining is uh, a lighter fabric in my lining there. Okay, this one over here though, this one again is done in the, the stitch and flip way with sashiko in the center of each one and then red stitching around as a decoration and to hold it all nice and still. My lining is a stripe, is a nice, uh, quite a rustic, firm, um, strong stripe and my bottom here is a nice, uh, beautiful Japanese denim, a beautiful, strong Japanese denim. Each one of these four sides has had uh, the iron-on felt attached to it. So they're very um, strong and sit quite um, straight, as you can see. In this case, the, the um, casing area is shorter, shorter than uh, than the sides it could have come out further but this is just uh, your 
your choice and makes then an individual bag. So then you draw it up just the same as the other one was drawn up and mine's got a little flower attached to it as well. So this is makes things very individual. If you have these tasks, if these um, different techniques in your um, uh, in your techniques to use in your work, you can apply them to all different uh, styles of bags and uh, things that you are making. Uh, and it gives you that more individual look. So then this one is then tied up and like, like so. And I use that as a bag for all bits and pieces for, for um, my sewing bits and pieces, okay, as well. Okay, I think that is uh, finally um, we're at, at end here. We've gone through a f uh, quite a few things today. We've uh, looked at lining, how to line something. We've looked at uh, doing stitch and flip, which is this technique here. And we've looked at putting casings in with squeeze frames. So we've gone through quite a few different techniques today, which I hope you will find useful in all your sewing. And until next time, thank you for listening.